Um, in this lecture, I want to ask what connects the three uh, people in my title, Jared Manley Hopkins, Arthur Conan Doyle, and J.R.R. Tolkien, Victorian science, bear in mind this is 1921, Victorian science would have left the world hard and clean and bare, like a landscape in the moon, but this science is in truth but a little light in the darkness and outside that limited circle of definite knowledge, we see the loom and shadow of gigantic and fantastic possibilities around us, throwing themselves continually across our consciousness in such ways that it is difficult to ignore them. Now, the author of that sentence was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the article from where it comes is entitled The Evidence for Fairies. What are we to make of this intervention by the man who created Sherlock Holmes, a character who epitomises sheer rationality? Holmes calls detective work an exact science. You may remember how he sniffs at the legend of the Hound of the Baskervilles as a collection of fairy stories. And yet here is Conan Doyle contending that fairies actually exist. But Conan Doyle is not, in fact, pitting himself against science. He is pitting himself against scientism. He is not objecting to the idea that science might have definite answers on certain definite questions. He is objecting to the idea that science might have all the answers to everything. Hilaire Belloc published an essay at around the same time on the word scientific, in which he observed that the word is used like the name of a tribal god to overawe an opponent and used with the force of finality as though, once used, all discussion ended. Conan Doyle is likewise seeking to open up discussion that science would end before it has even begun, a discussion of the supernatural. He's not appealing to the imagination as against science, he's appealing for a more imaginative understanding of science. That Conan Doyle wrote this article before actual fairy photographs were known to exist, but now that we have the photographs, this hugely strengthens his case, and the photographs are indeed included in this issue. And the editor ends by saying, these photographs speak for themselves. These are the photographs that will be known to many of you, the so-called uh, Cottingley fairies, um, taken by two young girls in West Yorkshire. I think the photographs are actually very beautiful and very arresting. But they're not very sophisticated, I think, as far as a fabrication goes. They are cardboard cutouts suspended in flight by hat pins. Um, even those who were sympathetic to the idea of fairy folk at the time raised an eyebrow at what they described as the distinctly Parisian hairstyles. So bear in mind, this is, this is rural West... I mean, it's not even Lancashire. We could imagine, <laughs> you could imagine a salon a la mode in the, in the rural Lancashire, but perhaps not in West Yorkshire. Um, so, in any event, however persuasive or otherwise these pictures might seem to be, what they cannot do is speak for themselves. Photography at this time was still a relatively new technology and a highly contested form of truth-telling. Conan Doyle knew this as well as anyone through his expert interest in the ways that photography was being used to advance science. He took a particular interest in microscopic photography of bacteria that was coming out of Germany at the time, and he also was an amateur photographer himself. <coughs> By the time those photogenic fairies from Cottingley came along, Conan Doyle was a professed spiritualist. That is to say, he believed it was possible to communicate with the spirits of the dead. But in signing up for spiritualism, he didn't think he was turning his back on science. The trappings of spiritualism that seemed to us most absurd the overexposed photographs, the ectoplasmic excretions, the tenebrous noises arising from seances. These are the very things that were for Conan Doyle its most credible proofs. Spiritualism is, by even the most generous measure, a weird religion. But after all, as Conan Doyle would say, the latest technologies and theories that were coming out of the laboratories of Cambridge and elsewhere at the same time were, by the scientific standards of the previous three centuries and more, themselves gigantically and fantastically weird. So tipping now to the second part, 
Having started in the middle of my story, it's now time for a flashback. I want to take us to the darkest hours of the 19th century, to the moment when, as Conan Doyle decried it, Victorian scientists were attempting to scrub the world hard and clean and bare, like a landscape in the moon. It's actually quite a complicated picture, but in simplest terms, we can notice a flip within a few generations. At the beginning of the 1800s, the dominant presumption was that the study of God's word in the Bible and the study of God's works in the natural world meant pursuing two sides of the same truth. Under the banner of so-called natural theology, scientists and theologians could meet on common ground. As scientists documented the ways in which nature showed evidence of design, theologians argued for the existence of a designer, God. This disciplinary double act had a decent run of it, but it couldn't last. If only the geologists would let me alone, I could do very well, but those dreadful hammers, I hear the clink of them at the end of every cadence of the Bible's verses. These famous words of John Ruskin from 1851 refer to the discoveries in geology that put the origins of the earth much earlier than a literalist reading of scripture allowed. Evolutionary biology likewise put the creation of the world's flora and fauna on far longer timescales than stated in the Bible. Now, into this epistemological fray entered a diminutive, red-headed man by the name of Gerard Manley Hopkins. Unlike Conan Doyle, who had been brought up a Catholic, Hopkins converted to Catholicism while he was an undergraduate. But Hopkins' reasoning for going over to Rome have some intriguing similarities with Conan Doyle's later intimations of the material world as being thrummingly alive with the spiritual. In a letter from 1864, Hopkins admonishes a friend for not being, being or seeming very Catholic, and he offers him the following advice. The great aid to belief, an object of belief, is the doctrine of the real presence in the blessed sacrament of the altar. Religion without that is sombre, dangerous, illogical. With that, it is, not to speak of its grand consistency and certainty, lovable. Hold that, and you will gain all Catholic truth. So we can take from Hopkins then that his faith is pressingly incarnational. It matters to him that it really is the body and blood of Christ in the host. But his incarnational faith extends to the whole of creation, to everything he sees, and he pursues it to an eccentric and even obsessive degree. In the winter of 1870, for example, one of the gardeners at Stonyhurst noticed Hopkins walking round and round and round some icicles and ice crystals on a path. The gardener reported that the pint-sized priest, Hopkins was five foot two, uh, must be, as he put it, simple-minded. In a sense, the gardener was right. Staring, sketching, taking notes of a seemingly trivial scene is exactly the sort of thing a child might do. And Hopkins exercised the same intensely innocent eye in his more overtly scientific enterprises too. He spent rather a long time in 1871 attempting to hypnotize a duck. Nothing else to say about that. <laughs> in 1883, he devoted even longer to trying to capture his impressions of the sky following the volcanic eruption of Krakatoa. Sunset watching is perhaps not quite as quirky as duck hypnotism, and Hopkins' impressions of the post-Krakatoa skyscapes were thought worthy enough to be published by the prestigious scientific periodical Nature. But the whole incident of Krakatoa had a definite freakishness about it. The explosion was the loudest sound the world had ever heard, bursting the eardrums of everyone within 40 miles and ricocheting four times around the globe. And the visual fallout was no less dramatic and much longer lasting. For months, the heavens of Hopkins' Lancashire, more than 7,000 miles away, were lit up with colours of the most eerie kind, greens, 
reds, oranges, pinks, and blues. It was like a vision of the end of days, and Hopkins predictably thrilled to it. Where Hopkins really embraces weird science, however, is not so much in the obsessiveness of his attention, nor in the objects of his attention. The weirdness of Hopkins' science expresses itself most fully in the claims he makes for what he observes. His most quoted testimony of finding God in the world comes from 1870 and concerns a bluebell, when he records that he's never seen anything more beautiful and he knows the beauty of the Lord by it. But this is not actually a very characteristic response. It's too measured and sober and matter-of-fact. More usually, Hopkins records his epiphanic episodes as sudden transports, as raptures, as ecstasies. Where the long tradition of natural theology had drawn on the analogy of God as a watchmaker, an image suggestive of a coolly detached celestial craftsman, Hopkins' glimpses of God catch fire. He feels as well as sees divinity in the world and it moves him to trembling. So, <clears throat> moving to the third and final part of my story, we must try time travel once more. But this time we're going to go forwards, past Hopkins, past Conan Doyle, and into the middle of the 20th century to meet the last of my three wise men. Unlike Hopkins and Conan Doyle, both of whom shared lifelong interest in science, J.R.R. R. Tolkien was a Luddite and proud of it. It was part of a pose he shared with C.S. Lewis as scholars of medieval literature who nurtured a generalised disdain for modern life, preferring not even to read newspapers. You might sympathise <laughs> right at the moment with this, as it, this was a kind of general, general position he had. Um, I have here a, an image of um, Tolkien, and I note to myself is show an image of Tolkien refusing modernity. That's the best I could do. Um, and I think there's a kind of studied unhurriedness about him there, and he's leaning against a tree, and he loved trees. And if you know from the Lord of the Rings, the Ents, uh, the talking trees, are forever admonishing all the other characters for being too hasty. And, and certainly, um, I mean, I, as a fellow academic, I do wonder whether or how he would have dealt with email, whether he would have a, 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 would he have a Twitter account, I don't know, um, a smartphone, I doubt it. But in any event, Tolkien is suspicious, generally, of what he takes to be a kind of accelerating pace of life and the intended intrusion of technology into everyday living. So to some extent, this was a pose, as I've suggested. Um, when, for instance, he was asked to consent to an audio recording of him reading The Lord of the Rings, he affected never to have seen a tape recorder before, and asked if he might cast out any devil that might be lurking in the machine by recording the Lord's Prayer first. <laughs> so Tolkien performed his little exorcism in 1952, at a time when audio recording was a commonplace, and he was clearly hamming it up, as suggested also by the fact that he chose to recite the Lord's Prayer in the extinct East Germanic language of Gothic. <laughs> but if, Goth, if, if, if Tolkien is having, um, as he clearly is, a bit of fun here, his badinage also expresses something honest and urgent in his aversion to technology. He railed against what he called the mass production robot factories. He bewailed the splutter of cars outside his Oxford home as Mordor in our midst. In fact, he left his home because of it. Um, he took to sending checks to the tax man with not a penny for Concord scribbled at the bottom. <laughs> so perhaps it's no surprise then that Saruman, the anti-hero wizard gone bad of the Lord of the Rings, is described as having a mind of metal and wheels. Writing to a friend, Tolkien commented that though his book seemed to be largely about power and the abuse and corruption of power, there were other issues more strongly in his mind. He names them. The fall, mortality, and the machine. As a final thought, bringing the three protagonists of my story together, we may just pause briefly by way of Lenten reflection 
consider how their respective searches for God might have a persistent relevance for us too. A Jesuit poet priest, a doctor turned detective writer and a scholar with a sideline in fantasy fiction. Whether presented as a joke or as portending profundity, it would be facile to suggest that these men were all cut from the same cloth. And yet, there is a common thread running through their lives. They each champion a conception of reason that is capacious enough to accommodate a spiritual life. Rather than oppose rationality and faith, they figure their faith as rigorously rational and as tested on the pulse of their own experiences. In however unorthodox a fashion, I'm thinking of Conan Doyle largely here, they urge us to think that there might be more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in materialist philosophy. The challenge is that Hopkins, Conan Doyle and Tolkien faced were each rather different and they're certainly not identical with those we face today. But the pressure surely persists between their time and ours and is perhaps stronger than ever to force God outside of the beaten bounds of our limited circle of definite knowledge. I should like to give Pope Benedict XVI the last word here, since this very argument was in part the burden of his magnificent Regensburg lecture in 2006. Namely, that as science offers us previously unimaginable riches and opportunities, at the same time, scientism, the conceit that science has all the answers to everything, threatens to deny or undo what is best in us and to exile the spiritual from our world. While we rejoice in the new possibilities open to humanity, Benedict writes, we also see the dangers arising from these possibilities, and we must ask ourselves how we can overcome them. We will succeed in doing so only if reason and faith come together in a new way, if we overcome the self-imposed limitation of reason to the empirically falsifiable, and if we once more disclose its vast horizon. Thank you.